College Hospital, Chennai. Sir's field of interest include pediatric nutrition and vaccinology. He has 21 years of teaching experience and has uh, more than 24 publications to his credit. He has also authored some of the few chapters in major textbooks and is the recipient of Best Teacher Award. Thank you, sir. Over to you, Dr. Benjamin. Thank you, Dr. Arul. Um, the topic of today is that we have two interesting topics. The first topic is uh, deficiency anemia. Addressing our deficiency, it's a very interesting topic. I would like to invite Dr. Aruna Rajendra. She's an MDDM, EBMT fellow, a pediatric hematologist, oncologist and a bone marrow transplantation physician. She's working as an assistant professor in the Department of Pediatric Hematology. oncology She's the head of uh, BMT consultant at VS Hospital Chennai and in Sims Hospital, Vadaparani. She's got a uh, credential to her by many publications as well as awards. Over to you, madam. Thank you. So I'm always amazed by how much information and knowledge you gain in the, these two days. Uh, I'm not going to tell you some things which are common in deficiency anemias. So we'll just go through things which are uncommon among the common. So mask has become a part of our life. So uh, hematologist depends on iron, B12, folate for the hematopoiesis to continue. But definitely some other uh, vitamins also contribute for hematopoiesis, including thymine, copper, uh, B6, and pyridoxin. So uh, I'm not going to tell you that iron deficiency will present as microcytic anemias. Uh, it, it has thrombocytosis. And they do not have spleen at presentation when they come to our clinics. But uh, we'll just remember these things. Uh, when we uh, prescribe iron, let us prescribe only ferric preparation, uh, like we'll prescribe only the ferrous salts, not to use ferric salts orally, because the absorption is, based, uh, is better when we use ferrous salts. So anything that is ferrous is OK, ferrous sulfate, ferrous fumarate, ferrous ascorbate, et cetera. We'll stop milk products. Uh, especially bottle feeding. It is very common uh, that the anemia may not get corrected when children continue to use milk products. So safe parenteral preparations are now available, but none of the parenteral preparations are as safe as oral line. So parenteral preparations have previously had issues of uh, anaphylactoid reactions. Now these are very uncommon, but it is still not as safe as the oral preparations. So we use parental preparations predominantly for children who have malabsorption or children who were uh, 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 having a menorrhagia, bleeding, adolescent girls. So there is no real lower cutoff for hemoglobin for which a mandatory transfusion is required. So we transfuse children only if the, these children are hemodynamically unstable. So we, uh, iron deficiency uh, is always a, a topic. I think even 10 years down the lane, we may be talking about iron deficiency, though there is a very easy method to treat iron deficiency. So we know that iron, we, have, we are one of the countries which, are, uh, which have a high percentage of iron deficient children, pregnant women, and reproductive age group women. But I think using prophylactic iron, so there is often a fear of using iron, whether iron will increase the oxidant injury during infections. Actually, nothing happens. Iron should be prescribed liberally, and this will help us one day come out of iron deficiency. So uh, children who have had compromised third trimester, either they were twins or they were a preterm, or they were having a they were small birth weight at, uh, they are small for dates. Those children are going to have iron deficiency within one to two years, they are going to manifest. So it is better to give prophylactic iron as early as uh, four to six weeks, or even if they are tolerating enteral nutrition earlier. So children with bleeding disorders, again children with menorrhagia, it is mandatory to prescribe iron, even if they are not having a overt iron deficiency anemia. So iron deficiency is not just anemia in children. So actually even adults, uh, the restless uh, red leg syndrome, one of the recent uh, quoted is uh, underlying iron deficiency anemia. Pica, which is a very common manifestation of iron deficiency, where children eat mud, where children eat uh, raw rice, ice, all these are a neurological manifestation of iron deficiency. Inedible things become more tastier. 
So uh, these are all uh, neurological side effect of iron deficiency, which we should remember. Cognitive dysfunction, which children develop during uh, the early developmental period when they are iron deficient, may not be completely reversible. So it is very important that we sh uh, adult with iron deficiency and children with iron deficiency are not equal. We are maybe more responsible to make sure that children don't have iron deficiency. So this is a six years old male. He presented with uh, insidious onset of uh, fatigueness. He was detected to have low hemoglobin during a routine school health camp. So he had history of being bottle fed. Mother had anemia during pregnancy. She required blood transfusions. Def his height and weight were lower. Uh, examination was unremarkable other than the severe pallor. So he had hemoglobin of 3.6 grams. WBC count of 3,600, platelets were also, so basically he had pancytopenia with microcytic anemia. Normal MCV for children is between 70 to 90 up to 10 years. After 10 years, they reach adult values of 80 to 100. So here MCV is very low, 45 femtoliters. So uh, because of pancytopenia, B12 level was also done. B12 was normal, ferritin was very low. Less than 12, some textbook says less than 15, of uh, ferritin uh, in the blood is considered to be low. So he was started on iron supplements. Uh, so whenever there is pancytopenia, there is always a trigger to do bone marrow, uh, to look for other causes. But uh, uh, because of low hemoglobin, he remained in hospital. He was monitored for hemodynamic instability. So on day three, he started becoming better. He uh, appetite improved. He was more playful. On day seven, his uh, hemoglobin started even showing a rise as early as day seven from 3.6 to 5 grams. So here, iron deficiency anemia is presenting as pancytopenia. So the, though these are rare manifestations, today we are talking only about rare things. These are not common. Iron deficiency anemia usually presents as isolated anemia with thrombocytosis and low MCV, and they don't have spleen. So sometimes they do present with small spleen, uh, a mild splenomegaly, because of long-standing iron deficiency anemia resulting in extramedullary hematopoiesis and spleen getting enlarged. But we never get moderate or massive splenomegaly with iron deficiency. They can present with extreme thrombocytosis where platelets are more than 10 lakhs. It can be a reason for, uh, like a cause for underlying prothrombotic state where children present with cortical venous sinus thrombosis. There are so uh, more than nine deficiency, uh, we are many times amazed by B12 deficiency. So B12, uh, the, these are the high risk population. People who are vegetarian, children who are vegetarian, uh, surgeries when it involves the stomach and the uh, small intestine, the ileum. Uh, when patients are on gastric acid suppression with proton pump inhibitors, H2 blockers, malabsorption, autoimmune disease, and genetic where children, if they have underlying immersion and Gresfax syndrome with defect in the cubum receptor. So this is a two years old child presenting with history of fever for one day. The next day, uh, child underwent a CBC as a part of fever workup. His hemoglobin was 5.4 grams. WBC count was 4,600. Platelet was 44,000. MCV was 60. So it appears like uh, iron deficiency anemia, again pancytopenia, but uh, almost similar to the previous case. But here he is admitted in the ICU with fever and hemoglobin of 5.4 grams. His LDH was normal. Serum ferritin is low for, uh, we, uh, we mentioned that 12 or 15 is the lower limit, but definitely it is 19 and he is febrile. It's definitely low ferritin. B12 levels were normal. A smear showed dimorphic anemia, both micro and macrocytes with thrombocytopenia. He is a lacto-vegetarian. Uh, he has never consumed meat. He had no localizing signs for fever and all infective workup, including dengue, scrub, malaria, they were all negative. On, uh, during serial CBC monitoring, he is still in the ICU with fever. On day five of hospital stay, the platelet dropped to 23,000 with persisting fever. Now it becomes more uncomfortable because the child is in ICU. He is monitored every day. He is undergoing CBC. It is dengue season. So child underwent a bone marrow aspiration to rule out underlying malignancies. So uh, actually, this uh, slide is not representative of this child, but actually the marrow revealed megaloblastic anemia. So here, if we see, uh, the, uh, uh, the smear actually shows in this slide. This has been taken from a journal. Uh, this, these are the hyper-segmented neutrophils. So when, the, when there are more than five segments, we call it uh, a hyper-segmented neutrophil. So here, the child has presented with dimorphic anemia. 
with megaloblastic anemia causing pancytopenia and severe thrombocytopenia. So many features are very un, uh, unusual in this child. We get megaloblastic anemia present like a hemolytic anemia. So they come with high LDH, they have jaundice, they have high MCV. So a normal MCV, normal B12 does not rule out megaloblastic anemia. So how to diagnose B12 deficiency? So almost nine out of 10 children are going to come with macrocytic anemia. Peripheral smear will show hypersegmented neutrophils. B12 will be low. So for ferritin, we told the number is less than 12. For B12, it is less than 200. And uh, this, is a, uh, this is sufficient for the diagnosis of B12 deficiency. Uh, we can always add on uh, elevated homocysteine level and uh, we can document uh, raised methylmalonic acid levels to uh, which will also go with the diagnosis of B12 deficiency. But sometimes, as in the previous case, MCV can be normal, B12 levels can be normal, and still, usually we see platelet count something like 70, 80, 90,000. We do not see severe thrombocytopenia and B12 deficiency, but the previous case was totally not following the routine rules. So uh, it was good for the family that a child had megaloblastic anemia. He got discharged. So uh, this is the pathway where we can understand B12. Uh, deficiency of B12 results in both an increase in homocysteine levels and uh, increase in methylmalonic acid levels. So a 16-year-old male, he, he is a pure vegan. Again, he has, uh, we know he has a megaloblast, he's prone for megaloblastic anemia. He came with complaints of giddiness, easy fatigability, and vomiting. He had history of fever one week back. We just lasted a day, an undocumented fever. Uh, on examination, he had severe pallor, uh, uh, a sallow skin, a knuckle hyperpigmentation, glossitis. So clinical diagnosis was megaloblastic anemia. CBC also, also showed a hemoglobin of uh, 4.6 grams and MCV of 104, so macrocytic anemia. He was started on parenteral B12 supplements. B12 levels were also low. So this is the outside CBC, which we can see the parameters, like platelet count of 68,000. So he came, he gave a blood test. Here his hemoglobin in the hospital was 3.6. WBC dropped further, platelet dropped to 17,000, though there was macrocytosis. But all the pictures actually were suggestive of B12 only. LDH was high. Uh, he had a dimorphic blood picture, pancytopenia, macrocytes were there. Retic count, uh, count was low. That uh, DCT was negative. He had a bit of uh, uh, unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. We don't see bilirubin more than three. In this case, it was 2.1. But uh, he had evolving thrombocytopenia. Platelet again dropped to 12,000, uh, where it started initially with 68,000. So he underwent a bone marrow examination. We, these are not usual scenarios to do marrow. When we suspect megaloblastic anemia, we do not do marrow to demonstrate megaloblastosis. So, but in this scenario, we can understand an adolescent coming with symptoms admitted in hospital with severe thrombocytopenia. He underwent a marrow examination after three doses of B12. Marrow showed erythroid hyperplasia. Then we were still uncomfortable. We did uh, dengue serology, though there was nothing suggestive of dengue. So he was dengue IgM positive and IgG positive. So he was discharged and reviewed after two days. So diagnosis was megaloblastic anemia with, I don't know, can we call it subclinical dengue infection. So during follow-up, his hemoglobin increased from this 3.6 to 7 was with transfusion. He, uh, he was becoming uh, very unwell. So his hemoglobin raised from 7 to 9. Platelet increased from 12 to 2.6 lakhs. And counts increased, WBC count increased from 3,800 to 6,000. So there are many things which complicate a common megaloblastic anemia presentation. Maybe he came to the hospital because he became so unwell with the dengue. But uh, he, uh, it was an underlying megaloblastic anemia. A 21-year-old 20, male, I'm not sure whether it is okay for a pediatric audience to hear, but uh, we do see uh, 21, 22 years. So he's a Jain by faith, poor vegetarian. He presented with severe fatigue and fear in view of thrombocytopenia and outside CBC. His mother was diagnosed to have a cancer in the past years. 
uh, and he had hyperpigmented knuckles, glossitis, 5 kg weight loss, anorexia. So his hemoglobin was 6 grams, WBC count was 3, pancytopenia 3000, platelet was 90,000, which was typical of megaloblastic anemia. MCV was 110 femtoliters. Blood smears showed even hypersegmented neutrophils. B12 was low, LDH was high. So this hemolytic picture is because of uh, ineffective erythropoiesis seen in megaloblastic anemia. He responded well to parenteral B12 uh, supplementation. So he also had history of hypothyroidism on thyroid supplements since 12 years of age, which is very unusual for a male, male to ha have hypothyroidism. So uh, he, he, had, he was tested for anti-thyroid antibodies, which was positive. He also tested positive for anti parietal cell antibody. Uh, he ideally requires testing for anti-intrinsic factor antibodies also, which was not done in his case. So he was diagnosed with pernicious anemia. So pernicious anemia is an autoimmune disease which affects the parietal cells in the gastric mucosa. And there is a, uh, the parietal cells participate in the production of intrinsic factor. And this results in megaloblastic anemia, which will be lifelong, unlike the nutritional anemias that we see because of B12 deficiency. So it is just to revise uh, that the B12, uh, once we consume through the diet, it gets uh, uh, attached to the salivary gland haptocorin. And the intrinsic factor, which is uh, seen as the green colored dot, so this travels along with this complex till the small intestine. So in the, after the, uh, like the pancreatic trypsin, uh, like cleaves the haptocorin, then the intrinsic factor binds with B12, reaches the ileal mucosa, where it gets absorbed with the cubum receptor. So this cubum receptor deficiency is one of, is the reason for the genetically uh, predisposed condition that is the immersalin Gressback syndrome, where patients will have, we see children less than one year presenting with B12 deficiency, and they have proteinuria. And uh, it is, these children also require lifelong B12, parental B12 supplementation. So this is something new, foot-bound cobalamin malabsorption. So it is not that we are not taking adequate B12, we are consuming adequate B12, but the gut is not absorbing the B12 because of impaired release of B12 from the foot. So because, uh, with uh, use of uh, regular use of proton pump inhibitors, H2 receptor antagonists, and use of metformin. Metformin also causes low B12 levels. So how to treat B12 deficiency? Usually when we see a symptomatic B12 deficiency child, we give at least one dose of B12 as parenteral. Subsequent doses are given as oral. Whereas the textbooks usually tell us a dose and the guidelines tell us a dose that is used for treatment of neurological manifestations of B12, where the B12 is given on alternate days for one to two weeks, then it is given weekly, then it is given monthly, then it is given once in three months. So it is very important uh, regimen for treatment of neurological manifestations of B12, whereas for nutritional anemia because of B12 deficiency, uh, like nutritional B12 deficiency, we can always supplement orally. Uh, and they are asymptomatic. If they are symptomatic, we can give say, a single dose, uh, that is a mega dose. Mega dose is 1,000 microgram. Our daily requirement is just 5 to 10 microgram. So we are going to give a mega dose of B12 parenterally and then give orally. So definitely oral B12 helps. Uh, but whenever I've told the patients you can take orally, they have preferred no doctor will take parenterally. So there is no uh, community uh, aggression against use of uh, parenteral B12. It is only adolescent girls who refuse parenteral B12. But I think oral should be sufficient in most of our cases. So there is something called time and responsive megaloblastic anemia. I have just seen two cases, in, uh, at least in the last decade, only two cases. So the, it is a, a megaloblastic anemia where we have normal B12, normal folate, but still there is megaloblastosis and there is, we can demonstrate a response to thymine. So there is associated progressive sensory neural hearing loss, diabetes mellitus. These three are the usual combination. Di a child who either has diabetes mellitus coming with pancytopenia, or a pancytopenic child later developed diabetes mellitus with hearing loss. Optic atrophy and diabetes insipidus or, or completes the dead mode syndrome abbreviation, but these are rare manifestation. It is uh, autosomal recessive inheritance, and uh, they have very little uh, 
uh, those requirements for insulin. So I've seen only one, uh, like the, the child required insulin of only one unit in a day was the requirement for the control of diabetes. So the other uncommon nutritional deficiencies, which is very, very rare, are pyridoxin deficiency leading to microcytic anemia. So pyridoxin deficiency may be it's a part of generalized malabsorption. Isolated pyridoxin deficiency is rare. It can be because of drug use, isoniazid, deep penicillamine, and or it can be a part of an IEM. So it can present with hematological and neurological side effects. Hemato uh, neurologicals are peripheral neuropathy and seizures. Hematological has microcytic anemia. When we do a marrow, we can demonstrate ringed cerebroblasts. Uh, this condition also has hyperhomocysteinemia. So when we have high homocysteine with normal MCV, we think of uh, pyridoxin deficiency. So copper defi we talk about copper excess in Wilson's disease. So copper excess causes uh, macrocytic anemia. Copper deficiency also, as in these conditions mentioned, as parenteral nutrition, ma malabsorption, gastrectomy, all these can present with, uh, or zinc excess. When zinc is used in excess, sometimes I'm uh, uh, amazed when we use 14 days or more zinc for diarrheal disorders. So we should also remember zinc excess use can lead to copper deficiency. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Aruna, for your uh, crisp presentation on a vast topic. Uh, the questions are most welcome to the floor. Good morning, ma'am. Uh, there are a lot of iron preparations in the market, ferrous ascorbate, ferrous fumarate, and a lot of uh, new iron molecules which, with the lower doses. Uh, which will you prefer in iron deficiency anemia children? And second question is, uh, uh, when we see splenomegaly in iron deficiency, uh, whether we need to go for HP ultraphoresis or uh, we can wait. And my third question is, uh, uh, do we need to investigate for uh, pernicious anemia on all the vitamin B12 deficiency children? Uh, 